Thank you for inviting me to speak at this meeting. It's a pleasure and I wish I could be there in person because this is really an important time for drug development and drug regulation. I can almost feel the tectonic plates shifting underneath us. So much is going on. And we all do need to work together even more uh, to manage the path forward. What, what are all these factors? Why is there this big shift? Well, first, I think the basic science is really driving things forward now and moving into the clinic with new technologies. And of course, the regulators are going to have to figure out how to uh, manage and uh, regulatory pathways for all these new types of interventions that are being studied. We're seeing gene therapy uh, come into the market, um, on antisense RNA, RNAi, uh, regenerative medicine, all these new technologies, and we're going to see drug device combinations and probably cells, drug devices, and so forth. And we have to figure out how to manage all this moving forward. Um, so how do we forge these new regulatory pathways and expectations? Uh, everything from how do you manufacture and control these new products to how you manage the clinical trials. Uh, it's very exciting. It's, uh, the science is wonderful, but it raises all kinds of new questions, and we have to make sure that uh, the regulatory pathway is not a barrier to innovation in this space. I think we can do these things, but we need to work together. So that's the good news, this driving force that we're all feeling of new technologies really uh, pouring into clinical evaluation. But at the same time, we have an old problem that's sort of holding us back. And that's our need for evidence generation, clinical evidence, and the fact that our current systems are not very functional. They are too expensive. The current clinical trial infrastructure is um, very uh, slow, uh, unresponsive, and clinical development programs every year are costing more and more. And this, I have said before, I think is an unsustainable system and we're going to have to think about new ways to evaluate all these products um, in the future. So we also are having to deal with the new expectations of the technology assessors. There's an increased need to clearly demonstrate the value of interventions before or soon after they get on the market. And even in the United States, justify the cost of these interventions by the value that they add. And that means additional evidence generation, generation of evidence of a new type in some cases, uh, added on to the current expectations for clinical development programs. So bottom line, if we're going to do this and evaluate all this new science and technology, we are going to have to redesign the clinical evidence generation system. And what do I mean by that? Well, many of you know I've said this before, and I think it is one of the most critical problems facing all of us. We need to think about use of master protocols um, and so forth, clinical trial networks, more efficient ways of uh, generating this evidence through pla various platforms they are being set up, early experiments are being done, but they're tremendous barriers. Just culture and habit and the way we do things is a barrier. The concern of sponsors about letting go of their product and not controlling the clinical trials in which it's evaluated. Uh, the lack of uh, too many worked examples to show success in uh, reducing costs and generating evidence. Um, it's a chicken and egg problem. I think if uh, master protocols could be widespread and successful, then everyone would be using them. But right now, we're just at the beginning. Tied to this is the use of real world evidence. And of course, you can't use real world evidence unless the technology is currently being used in the real world. And so, although I think we can use real world evidence much more, and we're being charged to do that as part of the CURES. Uh, legislation in the United States, and we're doing a whole program on it, 
it won't help with those early technologies and, and generating that evidence. And it is going to be uh, slow, but is gathering speed for follow-in indications, for better understanding comparative effectiveness, and so forth. And these are going to be critical issues going forward. Also, we need to really think about adopting uh, adaptive designs because those are woven into many master protocols. People are getting more used to them. This is, uh, I think, very helpful in socializing this idea. But again, there are downsides, both culture, habit, loss of control, and so forth, that lead to underutilization of adaptive designs. Also concerns, I think, that the regulators will not accept them, although I think that concern is being put to rest. So. Hopefully we will see more of that because we need more flexibility and dynamism in the clinical trial process. Now, also we need to think about new statistical methods. And FDA and the Center for Drugs is now taking seriously the use of Bayesian designs. Our biologic center and device center have been using these. Uh, they are powerful and hopefully we will use these when they're fit for the purpose uh, of which uh, the uh, program is designed. So need for evidence generation and summary is um, and better evidence generation and actually cheaper more efficient evidence generation to answer more questions is a critical need that we won't advance all this new science as rapidly as possible unless we solve those problems. Another force really major force that's affecting us is the patients have woken up and sudden and realized <laughs> that drug development is where new products come from for them. Drug development, device development, and so forth. And they want to have a voice. So patient involvement in development programs, in the regulatory standards, and after marketing is really becoming powerful. At FDA, uh, patient-focused drug development and patient involvement was made part of our mission by the CURES legislation, and it instructs us to go through a whole program to um, work with uh, the community to figure out how to instantiate patient uh, input and involvement as a routine part of the, our assessment process. I think this is very good news. This is where we should put our emphasis. It will help on the request for understanding the value of interventions because they need to be valued by patients and they need to reflect what they want and what they care about as far as mitigating their disease. So these are very good things, but there's a whole body of work laid out uh, for the FDA and I know that um, other regulators also are working on this and of course Sponsors are working uh, very hard on how to integrate patient input effectively as are various some consortia that everyone is involved in. So that's an important area. Now as a part of that, of course, uh, we need to figure out how to incorporate patient reported outcomes more routinely in clinical trials how to get them validated and so forth so they can be used and that also we were assigned more or less as part of um, as part of cures and PDUFA and we will be working on that and that's very exciting and I thank all the consortia that are working on this because it's quite important. Additionally um, people want to know uh, trade-off information for people with serious diseases how much of this or that would you trade off? What side effects would you find acceptable for some degree of amelioration? We've typically done this benefit-harm weighing without understanding the viewpoints of patients, the people who actually will bear the burden of the harms and uh, to whom the benefits will accrue. And so I think it's really important that we take this seriously and figure out how to uh, collect that representative and comprehensive information from patients with chronic diseases about how they feel about these things. And so that is uh, going to be a big body of work for the FDA and I think also internationally. We're all in this together and hopefully we will move forward on all these things. So that um, moves on to general translational science and I think the recognition, which is very good, that we really, between the basic science and access 
descriptive medicines, there's translational science that has been neglected and needs to be um, brought forward and, and elevated as far as its importance. The Cures legislation um, does that in many ways by really um, focusing, for example, on biomarker qualification and uh, clinical outcome assessment uh, qualification are put into Cures as part of our mission. Uh, we have to run a new process for this, uh, which we are putting into place right now. But really, that's translational science, and what FDA is just the end of that. We should be the sort of customers for that translational science, as we have new biomarkers, new outcome assessments, new patient reported outcome instruments are developed then we can assess their fitness for regulatory decision making. But really, we need to have a translational science enterprise that's capable of working on and generating these different evaluative tools so that they're fit for purpose and we have them ready to hand as development programs and new science comes along. So that's kind of how I see um, the environment right now and in the immediate tactical future, we're gonna be working on all of these elements. Of course, we have many other things to do as far as review, timeliness, and so forth as regulators, but these are the major themes, I think, that are affecting the whole enterprise. So I'm glad that uh, this uh, workshop is being convened. I think it's important to talk about uh, all these areas. Where are the gaps? How can we fill the gaps? How can we work together uh, to bring all this about? And uh, I look forward to uh, the results of this. Thank you again.